Every revolution starts in the minds of the people. Arm yourself for the war of ideas. Take back your life. Take back your liberty. Tom Mullen talks freedom. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Tom Mullen Talks Freedom. Today, my guest is Scott Horton. And if you don't already know Scott, Scott is the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of antiwar.com, host of Anti War Radio on Pacifica 90.7 FM, KPFK in Los Angeles, California, and podcast The Scott Horton Show from scotthorton.org. He's also the author of the 2021 book, Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism, and the 2017 book, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. He's also editor of the 2019 book, The Great Ron Paul, The Scott Horton Show Interviews, 2004 to 2019. He's conducted more than 5,500 interviews since he began in 2003, so Scott's done a heck of a lot for freedom, and he continues to do so. Welcome to the show, Scott. Thank you very much, Tom. Happy to be here. Now, what's on everyone's mind on the foreign policy front, of course, is Ukraine, and we'll get to that in a second. But I wanted to ask you first about the Middle East, because we had a very, not very impressive withdrawal, but a withdrawal nonetheless from Afghanistan. We had this little statement by Biden that we still might be conducting over-the-horizon counterterrorism operations. Sounds a lot like bombing people. And I know we probably still have a couple dozen bases around Iran. What's going on in the Middle East now that we're out of Afghanistan? All right. Well, so on Afghanistan first, I think that that is just talk. I believe that essentially was maybe a little bit of wishful thinking on the part of the Biden people, but mostly was meant to appease their critics to the right, well, and liberals too, who were criticizing them for leaving Afghanistan. And the idea was, oh no, now the world's going to fall apart because we're not occupying Afghanistan anymore and all the terrorists are going to come and get us and all this. And so the White House was saying, no, don't worry, we're still going to do some drone strikes and we're still going to do some things against these guys. But the reality is they can't. Because what are they going to do? Fly a drone from the Indian Ocean over Pakistan and the mountains, more than a thousand miles inland from the Indian Ocean over mountain ranges and all that to hunt targets in the Nangarhar province or something like that. It's not going to happen. And I'm not the expert on what's going on with America's relationship with Pakistan right now. And I really should catch up on that. But I think their prime minister, Imran Khan, has no interest in allowing America to have bases in Pakistan for use to wage strikes in Afghanistan, which was one of the ideas that Biden himself had floated that I think was just shot down essentially immediately. And so where are they going to hit them from? Afghanistan is too remote. Here's the thing of it too. Who do they have to kill left in Afghanistan? Once you get honest and stop conflating Al-Qaeda and ISIS with the Taliban, then you realize that the Taliban aren't your enemy at all. And it doesn't matter if they rule Afghanistan. And in fact, guess who is the Taliban's enemy? Not us when we're not killing them, but ISIS. And I don't know so much about Al-Qaeda, but I think the rumors of their alleged continuing with Al uh, relationship with Al-Qaeda are quite overblown. And there's hardly anything left of Al-Qaeda in Pakistan or anywhere really around there for them to ally with anyway. But there's certainly bloody enemies of ISIS there and even have committed atrocities against them. And even in October 2019, the Washington Post had a piece where JSOC, our top tier special operations guys, the combat applications group, Delta Force, and the Navy SEAL uh, Team 6 and whatever, very top tier special operations forces, they're flying drones as what they called the Taliban Air Force, flying air cover for the Taliban, fighting against ISIS there. So remember, the one victory that David Petraeus ever won in his life was over W. Bush, when he convinced Bush, we're not going to defeat the Sunni insurgency in Afghanistan. We're going to ally with them, and we're going to pay them and bribe them to just kill the foreign fighter jihadi bin Laden types who traveled to Iraq to fight the Americans. Egyptians and Syrians and Saudis and Libyans 
we're going to pay the local Iraqi, formerly Sunni insurgency, to cease fire with us and take the fight to their former allies, these crazy international bin Ladenite types. Well, that's the same thing here. And it's the same thing that they could have done all along. Oh, Taliban, we'll call you the awakening movement. We'll make friends with you. And you promise just to keep international Arab terrorists out. They could have done that the whole time. And in fact, despite all of their lies in direct contravention of all of their lies, the Taliban and Al Qaeda never liked each other in the first place. And before September 11th, the Taliban was trying to give bin Laden up. The CIA even admitted it in the Washington Post that they've been in negotiations with them since after the Africa embassy bombings in the summer of 1998. And that the Taliban, as Milton Bearden, the former CIA station chief during the 80s Afghan war, who ran the 80s Afghan war, he told the Washington Post, he says, the Taliban would say to us, oh, bin Laden is out falconing in the countryside somewhere where we can't protect him trying to send us the signal that you guys could go ahead and kill him right now and then we would be able to say ah geez we weren't able to protect him because he went out to the countryside where we couldn't protect him and then it won't be our fault that you guys went ahead and take and took your shot so go ahead and take your shot elbow and then as milton bearden put it we don't do signals so then the american answer is hand him over towel head but they just handed him over on a silver platter and you refuse to take the chance. And we know that the CIA gave Bill Clinton 10 chances to kill bin Laden in Afghanistan before September 11th. And that Bush had his chances in the summer of 2001. He sent JSOC to Pakistan, but they never did anything when all they had to do was get in a helicopter and fly over to the Kandahar province and take care of business real quick and out again. They'd have been fine. Bin Laden lived on a farm on the outskirts of town. So, so people don't get lost here too much that... You're giving me good news for everyone outside the beltway. The fact that Biden was just talking as far as these over the horizon attacks, that's great news. Yeah. And the threat of international terrorism emanating out of Afghanistan is also false and really is not a concern. It's been a, essentially a lie to help keep us there for the last 20 years, but it's never really been a problem. They are the Taliban are concerned with preserving their own power, not advancing some crazy Saudi Leninist weird version of world revolution. Which also sounds familiar because we also were told that Saddam Hussein was buddies with Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. That wasn't true either. It was almost as untrue as with the Taliban. That's right. I mean, the Taliban essentially were stuck with bin Laden. When bin Laden went there in 96, he was expected to be kept by his old friend Rabani. And, you know, the Taliban ended up taking power instead. And he had no prior relationship with Mullah Omar, the leaders of the Taliban, and a very kind of tenuous and fraught relationship the whole time. And the Taliban found it difficult to just hand him over. But again, they pretty much did. They offered to hold a trial in some other Muslim country. and But they weren't buddies. They essentially kept him straight. And yes, after September 11th, they offered to negotiate his extradition. And Bush said no negotiations refused to deal with the Taliban. And then what'd he do? Then he let bin Laden escape, took the fight to the Taliban instead, and dedicated minimal resources to the hunt for Al-Qaeda while they were still in the country and let them escape to Pakistan. And then as you and all of your audience has heard a million times over, once bin Laden slipped across the border into Pakistan, well, that was just it. And then we could never chase him or do anything to try, even though we got the Delta Force. And this is just an invisible line on the, in the dirt. It's not even there. It's in your imagination only. They're out in the wilderness. They could have walked after bin Laden. It would have been fine. And they would have got him right then and there. But Bush wouldn't let them do it. He took to the fight to the Taliban instead of al-Qaeda. And then you talk about Saddam Hussein's only relationship with bin Laden was that his intelligence people had met with bin Laden over the years to find out what it would take to keep them out of Iraq and to keep them from making trouble with Saddam Hussein. And there's rumors that the Iraqis had offered the Al-Qaeda guys a relationship at some point in the mid-90s or something, and that bin Laden had turned Hussein down, and that even that was ancient history, and I'm sure that's probably overblown anyway. I doubt that, that much is even true. But certainly, it mattered, right? People should have been able to tell. Some of us could. Everyone should have been able to tell.
that this guy with the Obi-Wan Kenobi robe and the beard down to his knees and this guy in the olive green with the French beret and the clean shaven chin are totally different dudes with totally different agendas. You can tell by their costumes, frankly. Like you can tell, as George Carlin might say, by their hats, <laughs> who they are and what they're doing, right? And Saddam Hussein just was not a jihadi at all. The guy worshiped only himself. Everybody knows that. Give me a break. And what is as obvious now as was obvious then that if they didn't have any pre-existing agendas to go to Iraq, the neoconservatives were not hell bent on regime change there for Israel's interests. And the arms manufacturers over at Lockheed weren't trying to get away with murder. But just if George Bush had been some regular schmuck with no agenda who wanted only to protect the American people, then what he would have done is he would have sent Donald Rumsfeld to Baghdad on a plane to shake Saddam Hussein's hand again, like it was in 1983. Only this time, instead of supplying him with hundreds of millions of dollars worth of weapons and biological weapons, precursors, and all these things, as Rumsfeld did, they would have just said to him, listen, welcome back in from the cold. You're now fit to rejoin the international community on two conditions. You keep Al-Qaeda down and out, no massacres. And that's it. The Cold War against Iraq is over. We soundly smashed his military into the ground in 1991. They ceased to be even a regional power by February of that year. In two weeks, American air power had decimated his armored divisions and the rest. There's just the idea to think back on it. Now, it was funny then at the time, too. If you didn't believe in it at the time, it was crazy how crazy it was. But especially now, just think of the absurdity that this is the narrative that they spun. Karl Rove and his White House Iraq group sat around and said, okay, here's the narrative. Saddam is going to make a bunch of sarin, and then he's going to give it to Osama. And then Osama is going to attack the United States somehow through a hijacking or something. That big Air Force he has. Yeah, you know, the whole thing was just stupid. The whole thing was just try to keep you afraid. And Bush said, I actually saw this clip. I had forgotten this exact quote. There are so many of them. But in the recent Tucker Carlson special about January 6th, he plays a clip of Bush saying, when it comes to the war on terrorism, you cannot differentiate between Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden. It's like, what does that even mean? Like you're forbidding me from differentiating between them or what? Like, it doesn't mean anything other than he's betting that you're dumb enough to buy it. He's betting that you'll say, fine, Mr. President, if you want to have another war, then I guess you must have your reasons. And I know because I was driving a cab at that time that that was what the public thought. The public would say to me, the regular people in my cab would say to me, well, there must be some secret intelligence that they can't share with us that really explains why they're doing what they're doing. Because you're right, Mr. Cab Driver, that what they've claimed so far isn't really proven or backed up by evidence or even really very threatening sounding. You're telling me they got a warehouse of VX somewhere. That doesn't sound like my problem, really. Like, uh, why should I be afraid of that, even if that were true? And they would all say, well, they must have some secret information that they can't tell us about without revealing their sources. There must be a good reason for this or else why would we be doing it? And so I guess we'll just defer to them. But that just goes to show that even at the time, even then the people who wanted to defer to Bush and his men had to concede that they haven't made a case. We just have to trust them that they know what they're doing, that they wouldn't be doing this if they didn't have a good reason to do it. And so we're going to go along with it. And that was even the Hawks would say there must be some. And they would all say it. it was like a refrain. It was like slipped across the border into Pakistan. It was like spider hole. Everybody's just supposed to say these, these incantations of the terror war. Orange alert. I remember back then too, and I always just thought, I'm in a skewed place. I'm in New York State. I never met anybody who thought it was a good idea to go to Iraq. Nobody. I'm wondering, where is this guy getting the support for this kind of thing? Of course, he probably didn't have any. So we regime changed Iraq, and we know how that went, and we regime changed Afghanistan, so we replaced the Taliban with the Taliban. The last thing before Ukraine, what about Syria? 
So <laughs> as far as I know, we, we regime changed Syria, so we replaced Assad with Assad there, right? Or am I wrong? Yep, you're exactly right. The big story out of Libya, as bad as Libya was, was that they took all the jihadists and guns. The Libyans that they fought the Libya war for, these were the Libyan veterans of Iraq War II. These were Zarqawi's guys. Again, Saddam Hussein had kept them all out. Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with these guys. Once America invaded and overthrew him, they turned all of Western Iraq into Jihadi University for five years. As I said, then eventually the local uh, Sunni Arab tribal leaders turned on them and drove them back out again. But then, so what does that mean? That means they went back home to Yemen and Libya and Syria. So then Obama does what? As soon at the exact time he's killing Osama in Pakistan, he's taking his side in Libya. They fight a nine month regime change war for Gaddafi in Libya. And then they take all the jihadis and the guns from Libya and they transfer them onto the next one in Syria. And to his credit, Obama was too much of a coward to go all the way through with carpet bombing Damascus the way he did Tripoli and forcing a real regime change the way they did in Libya. He was too terrified. He was going to go down in history, which he still will, but not to the same degree. He was terrified he would go down in history as the man who put Al-Qaeda on the throne in Damascus because there was no other real opposition to do it. He knew. It's not to give him credit or anything. It's the furthest thing from it. But just it's to give him credit for his intelligence anyway that he knew, as he later told Thomas Friedman, the idea that we could build up an army of moderates, an army, an armed force of moderates who were going to be able to, of uh, as he described them, as the cliche went at pharmacists and doctors and lawyers and farmers and people of the neighborhood who are going to come together as citizens and, and be able to fight against and overthrow Assad and his army, which is backed by Iran's Quds Force and Lebanese Hezbollah and then eventually Russia. The idea that that could happen is a pure fantasy. And of course, the way he constructed it, he neglected to mention that if they really were going to create this wonderful democracy, they would also have to kill off everybody in Al-Qaeda and ISIS and all the jihadist groups fighting on their same side in this rebellion. They would be expected, talk about a pure fantasy, forget about it. This whole thing from the very beginning was never going to work. And from the very beginning of the war, from 2011 on, I'll tell you, in April of 2011, John Hanna, who was Dick Cheney's man from the W. Bush years in the vice president's office, wrote a thing in foreign policy, said Prince Bandar bin Sultan is back in charge in Saudi. He's now the chief of intelligence and he's sending he's opening his jails. He's sending jihadis off to fight in Syria. That was in April of 11. And that was all you needed to know right there. Alistair Crook and Eric Margolis, and later we found out from the Stratford leak, and a handful of other sources indicated throughout the first year of the Arab Spring, 2011, in America and our NATO allies, especially the French who formerly dominated Lebanon and Syria, are involved on the ground supporting this insurgency against Assad. And we knew, what else do you need to know? The Saudis are sending jihadists. In other words, the same force, the same armed force leading the rebellion against Assad on the ground in Syria are the same guys, the same guys who were the worst of the Sunni-based insurgency that fought the Americans in Iraq War II from 2003 through 2008. These were the suicide bombers, the head choppers, the bin Ladenites, the maniacs. That's who. And the Saudis supported them against our guys. Our great allies, the Saudis, supported them against our guys in Iraq War II because our guys were fighting on the side of the Shiites there. And now to make up for it, America's taken their side in Syria. So you want to talk about the rise of the Islamic State, which conquered all of Syria, all of eastern Syria, pardon me, in 2013, and then conquered all of western Iraq one year later in the spring of 2014. All of this, the rise of all of that, it was just like with Iraq War II. This is the slowest motion train wreck you could have possibly imagined. How could anyone, how could the Democrats, how could the CIA continue this policy where they're directly arming 
they are putting tow missiles and high quality rifles and explosives directly in the hands of Al Qaeda in Iraq, in Syria. And everybody knew it and they wouldn't stop it. And it led to the rise of the Islamo fascist caliphate that just a few years before had been ridiculous propaganda from George W. Bush and Karl Rove and Glenn Beck, that there's this Islamo fascist caliphate out there that we have to fight. Where is it? What is it? The lost continent of Atlantis or something? <laughs> the Muslim world is divided up by 50 nation states, all of whom have a thousand things not in common with each other and are not in any sense a united force other than as American satrapies. The only major Muslim states that didn't belong almost outright as the private property of the American empire in that era was Syria and Iran. Even Libya had come begging in back in from the cold in 03. Syria and Iran were the only countries in the region we didn't control. Iraq wasn't a dictatorship anymore, unless you count it as a dictatorship of the Shiites over the Sunni Arabs. It's something like a parliamentary democracy for the Shiite supermajority. But every other nation state in the region is a kingdom that belongs to the Americans. And anyway, it, on the Turks, but they're not Arabs, but they're Sunnis and on our side. And more of an authoritarian state than a real democracy anyway. Um, and there was no caliphate. The whole thing was an absolute hoax. Again, Saddam Hussein was sitting on Mesopotamia. The guy in the French beret was holding all of that area down. Where are you going to put your caliphate when the whole thing is divided up by America's puppet in Jordan and America's puppet in Saudi and our former puppet, but very secular dictator of Iraq? So then Bush gave them Western Iraq and Obama gave them Eastern Syria. And then they combined together to create the caliphate of 2014 through 17. But then Obama had to launch Iraq War III to destroy again. Now, and, are they really you gone? Know, far more than half a million people were killed overall in the Syrian war. And as you put it, to regime change Assad with Assad. And there's the same man sitting in the same throne. And the whole thing was for nothing. We still got troops there. Ask me what the troops are doing in eastern Syria right now, Tom. I was going to ask, are we really out of there? No, they're right there still. They're right there still because they're occupying the wheat fields and the oil fields to keep them out of the hands of the Syrian state and populations. And about how many troops do we have there? A few thousand, between two and five, probably something like that. And then there's a base called al Tamf that's right at the uh, Syrian and Iraqi border. And if you go back and look at this, there's just no secret about it. There's just no denying it, man. Even Google, for all their censoring, will show you that when Donald Trump wanted out of Syria in 2018 and 2019, and they stopped him both times, pardon me, it was 17 and 18, and they stopped him both times, it was the Israelis who were screaming that if you do this, you will be leaving open a Shiite land bridge, aka a road, as the rest of humanity calls them, a land bridge from Tehran to Beirut. It used to be secular Sunni Saddam Hussein stood astride that freeway, that highway. Now he does not. Now Iraq is ruled by a supermajority Shiite state in alliance with Iran and in alliance with Assad's government in Syria and in alliance with Lebanese Hezbollah. So now, Israelis' worst nightmare has come true in that the Americans have helped to solidify this Shiite crescent. And the whole joke is, of course, that it was Netanyahu's men in America who lied us into that war because they stupidly thought that if we got rid of Saddam Hussein, that would give the Jordanian king and the Turks dominance over Iraq. And then they would force the Iraqi Shiites to force Lebanese Hezbollah to stop being friends with Iran and be friends with Israel instead. I know, you're looking around like, <laughs> what? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I know, it doesn't make any sense. And that's why Paul Wolfowitz and David Wormser and Richard Pearl thought they were so brilliant, Douglas Fife thought they were so brilliant that this is what they're going to do. And they're gonna invade Iraq, they're gonna take Iraq from Saddam, they're gonna give it to the King of Jordan, 
and he's going to make the Iraqi Shiites make the Lebanese Shiites stop being friends with Iran and be friends with Israel instead. It's called the clean break. And then, so what do they do? Instead, they built the land bridge from Iran through formerly Sunni dominated Iraq. Now through Syria, which was already friends with Iran, but is now closer and more dependent on Iran than ever before because Iran helped to back Hezbollah as well to come to Syria to save his bacon to, to Assad's government in the face of the CIA's bin Ladenite suicide bomber cadres. And so just like with Iraq War II, just like with every single one of these things, they've done nothing but backfire. Afghanistan is the only one where you can say the thing was this absolute catastrophe, kind of almost in isolation. It didn't reverberate in a way where it severely empowered America's enemies against it or that kind of thing. It was just a horrible thing that happened. But everything that took place, everything that Bush and Obama did west of Iran has just been an absolute catastrophe, has only empowered Al-Qaeda and their copycats and has only empowered Iran on the other side as well. And the American people, and for that matter, the Israelis have gained nothing. The only thing the Israelis have gained is that now the Sunni Arab states are more afraid of Iran and so more willing to deal with Israel. But that all just means that they have a more powerful Iran to deal with. So at the very best, it's a wash. Let's take a short break for this important message. Friends, I've seen a lot of political movements come and go over the 14 years I've been writing about politics. The right went from being dominated by the interventionist neoconservatives to the anti-deficit Tea Party to the economic nationalism of the MAGA movement. The left went from Obama's hope and change, whatever that meant, to Occupy Wall Street to Bernie Sanders, the squad, and democratic socialism. Through it all, the one institution that causes most problems with the American economy has escaped serious criticism. My new book, It's the Fed, Stupid, is an appeal to Americans across the political spectrum to stop supporting politicians and policies that don't make a difference and focus on the one institution that causes most of the problems they worry about, the Federal Reserve System. Download a free copy of my new ebook, It's the Fed Stupid, at itsthefedstupid.com. And now, back to our episode. I'm here to tell you that that just ain't true. We help each other when we don't mean to. That's what we call the invisible hand. Something no politician understands. Just leave it up to supply and demand. So it sounds like maybe the war on terrorism is over for now because we lost. If you look at the kind of goals that they never really told us what the goals were, but it's certainly not empowering the Shiites and Iran to kind of network through the whole region. Do you think we can expect to see some new reason to get heavily involved there or we're going to be concentrating on China and Russia from now on? I think the real problem, as always, is Yemen right now. It's the worst catastrophe in the world in terms of humanitarian crisis and the results of America's war there in alliance with Saudi, UAE, and unfortunately, Al-Qaeda. If you remember when Obama started the drone war against Al-Qaeda in Yemen, or in Yemen back in 2009, it was against Al-Qaeda. But then seven years ago, in 2015, he switched sides and took Al-Qaeda's side and Al-Qaeda fighting in alliance with the UAE and the Saudis and the Muslim Brotherhood on the ground there against their enemies, the Houthis. Why? Because the Houthis are Shiites and friends with Iran. And so right now, after seven years of this, and including a genocidal war, frankly, against the civilian population of that country in a failed attempt to get them to buckle and surrender, which is not succeeded whatsoever in anything except killing civilians by the hundreds of thousands and, and maybe more. At the end of this, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, the guys that bombed the USS Cole, the guys that tried to blow up the plane over Detroit on Christmas Day 2009 with the underpants bomb, remember Abdul Muttalib? 
the guys that shot up the Charlie Hebdo magazine in France and did the Nice and other Paris attacks. The Eagles of Death Metal concert, I believe, was also AQAP involved in that. And they did, they tried to blow up two planes with printer cartridge bomb plots that were luckily foiled. So these guys, and they actually helped to uh, coordinate this September 11th attack. The Hani Hanjur, I believe it was, was one of the San Diego cell Flight 77 hijacker pilots. And his father-in-law owned a house in Yemen that they called the Switchboard House, where they communicated between Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and in Europe and in the United States, where they're plotting the attack against us. So these aren't just, oh, Al-Qaeda tied some Sunni militia somewhere. These are real Al-Qaeda guys who have attacked the United States repeatedly. And ever since seven years ago, we've been fighting a war for them against their enemies there. When this stage of the war ends and we switch sides again back, we are going to find that we have a real menace, I'm afraid, in terms of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And I'm not, I didn't come on your show here to justify further war, although it could sound like that because I'm also not one to play down the danger of some of these groups. That's what's so outrageous about America taking their side in Libya and Syria and Yemen the way that they have. I don't hate the Al-Qaeda more, pardon me, the Ayatollah more than Al-Qaeda. Iran hasn't attacked the United States since they helped a militia blow up the Marine barracks in 1983. Well, Ronald Reagan sold them missiles one year later, okay? So I'm not, I'm supposed to hate the Ayatollah as much as an Israeli general does, but I don't have a reason to. And, but they have American foreign policy siding with al-Qaeda as long as the enemies are the Shiites. And hell, in Libya, the enemies weren't even the Shiites. In Libya, the enemy was Gaddafi, who was a loyal pet again, or not that loyal, but had been brought in from the coal by W. Bush. They went ahead and took al-Qaeda's side against him anyway. But boy, when it comes to Shiite power in the region, the only Shiite government we're not supporting al-Qaeda against is in Iraq, because that would just be too embarrassing. We fought against al-Qaeda for eight years to install that Shiite government in power. Can't turn right around and take the suicide bomber's side, but otherwise we would. If it wasn't for the embarrassment, Tom, that's exactly what they would do, is they would be outright on the side of the bin Ladenite Sunni suicide bombers through the region forevermore. And so I'm predicting that the terror war is not over at all, that when this phase of the war in Yemen ends, probably going to have the country divided again. And then we're going to send special operations and CIA back to war against AQAP. And that could be a war that could last a very long time. Because again, I mean, their power and influence in that country has been expanded by 10,000 times. Who even knows the proper estimate, but it's a hell of a lot. Is there any hope that perhaps uh, the Shiites, Iran and their allies, somewhat keep the Al-Qaeda, the Sunnis down or neutralized to any extent? They did help clear them out of Western Iraq, that's for sure, in the defeat of the Islamic State there once America had created it. But overall, of course, the real problem is the more the Shiites help to fight them, the more they motivate the Saudis and others to back them and support them. Mm -hmm. in so the question really is, will the Americans ever switch sides back to the Iranians in order to hem in the Saudis and these extremists? And I think the answer to that is probably not because the Israel lobby has too much of a say over it here. And in fact, this is what the entire controversy over the Iranian nuclear program is about. It's not that they're making nukes, they're not. The Ayatollah decided a long time ago, they're not making nukes. But the Israeli, the way the Israelis look at it is there's a danger that America and Iran could start getting along again. And so they have to prevent that at all costs. We have too many interests in common, particularly when it comes to oil and money. There's a lot of reasons for the Americans to want to get along with the Persians. And so it's the Israelis' primary objective is to make sure that America and Iran can never mend fences. It's part of what's going on with the, the, the Iran nuclear deal. Why? Netanyahu insisted that Trump cancel that deal. He tried, he did everything he could to stop Obama from signing it. And then he succeeded in getting Trump to cancel the deal because that was the crack in the door. That was the opening of the door. If we have real assurances 
real undeniable assurances that they're not making nukes, well, then hell, eh, doors open from there. We can talk with them about who knows what now. Bring up whatever you want. No promise that you'll get results, but why not talk to them? If we can talk to them about nukes, then we can talk to them about Hezbollah. If we can talk to them about nukes, maybe we can talk to them about missiles. If we can talk to them about nukes, maybe we can talk to them about American oil companies investing and doing business and developing and exporting oil from Iran. And so from the Israeli strategist's point of view, that is the ultimate nightmare. And they'll do everything they can to keep the fake hoax threat of an Iranian nuclear weapon alive to prevent that from happening. And which works. Here we had a deal that double extra super locked down their nuclear program more than before. And they spun it as guaranteeing that Iran will make a nuke. And that's why we have to cancel. Now they have more uranium and rich to higher grades than ever before. Are you surprised? But that's good. That, that's actually the result that they vastly prefer. I remember them being six months away from this nuke, I, I think in the 1990s, at least by the early 2000s. So I've been hearing that most of my life. That's right. And think about it, we're talking about 1940s technology here. Never even mind fusion. We're just talking about splitting uranium atoms. You can, do, you can look up on the internet how to do that. You need weapons grade uranium, and then all you do is blast basically like a shotgun slug of uranium into a target of uranium at a high enough speed, and it goes bang. You can kill a whole city with one. That's how they did the Hiroshima bomb, a simple gun type uranium nuke. They could have had that at any time if that's what they were trying to achieve. It's just not true. And it's, it is true. You could say that their nuclear weapons threshold state that the Ayatollah is essentially saying, look, I have a revolver in one pocket and bullets in the other. Don't make me load it and we'll get along just fine here. He's not even, which is the same as Brazil and the same as Japan, by the way, that everybody knows they've mastered the fuel cycle. Everybody knows they could make nukes. Nobody mess with them. And we won't, it won't come to that and we won't have that kind of a problem. And so I think that's fair if you want to accuse them of, having a latent nuclear deterrent, I'll agree that they have created that in the form of their civilian nuclear weapons program, which is, again, a potential threat, but not meant to necessarily be one at all. At some point, it's got to be like trying to keep gunpowder away from some country. I would imagine in the future, everyone's going to have a nuclear capability. One more thing about that, Tom, is that look at all the nuclear states in the world that could have nuclear weapons that completely forego them, that seem to have no desire whatsoever to possess a nuclear arsenal. Look at Spain or Italy. Now, they're allies with us, and so maybe they figure that they're protected by us and don't really have a threat. But I mean, there are countries all over the world where they figure that actually wearing a gun on your hip is provocative and might cause a problem where you're better off just minding your manners and getting along with your neighbors and not having to, to threaten anyone or deter anyone that strongly. So I think it is possible to have a world without nukes. I don't think you need a world government to enforce that or anything like that. I think we just need to, we need to have the population of the world insist that we don't trust our politicians with these things. So it is relatively good news, your take on the over the horizon thing in Afghanistan. If that's just talk, what about Ukraine? So on one hand, I've got two ways I could look at it. One is Biden's got to make some noise. He knows he can't do anything if Putin goes into Ukraine again. So he's going to say something about sanctions and it's going to be real serious and we're going to build up our troops there. But that's as far as it can go. The other hand is, boy, this is very dangerous something that we should just stay out of, but we're not going to stay out of it. Could this lead to war? What do you think? I like to think that Biden is going to back down. I think there's a lot of pressure on him to talk tough and act tough in this situation, unfortunately. But the major concession has already been made. And that is that Biden announced publicly three weeks ago that America will not invite Ukraine to join NATO anytime in the next 10 years, which is essentially indefinitely. And he was asked at a press conference, well, if Russia does invade Ukraine, are you going to send American troops to fight them? And he goes, no, I am not doing that. And our obligation to NATO is one thing, but Ukraine is not in NATO and we do not have a defense treaty with them. And no, I forgot exactly the rest of the answer if he tried to warn against it. But essentially, 
when they say severe consequences, they don't mean severe consequences. And they've made that clear. Severe consequences means sanctions. And the Russians have already said that, yeah, we already took that into account. You kick us out of SWIFT, we'll just make our own SWIFT with uh, China and our other Asian allies and with Iran. And we'll just have to get by without the West then. And which would be crazy. Like, why in the world should America do that? Why in the world should America do everything they can to force China, uh, to force Russia away from Europe and away from the West and to towards Asia? It doesn't make any sense for them to do that. It's all just arms sales and all this. It's not any intelligent strategic purpose behind it. It's funny because the whole Ukraine thing started with them trying to get Ukraine into the European Union. And of course, if this all happens, well, I guess that Ukraine would go in, but the economic consequences with Russia, and I know that's going to hurt Ukraine quite a bit, it'll just be another disaster. It'll be another, we spent five years and all this money and we got exactly the opposite result. Yeah. And that's the thing, right? So go back to 2014, America overthrew the government of Ukraine for the second time in 10 years overthrew the same guy, Yanukovych, who was the pro-Russian leaning guy who had won the election fair and square and in both cases. And the second time they did it, the new government, and Biden was directly in on this, by the way, on the coup in February 2014. And then the first thing they did was outlaw Russian as an official language, just like half the population of the country. There's a on a major declaration of culture war against them. And, and then they also, what, three or four former Ukrainian presidents all signed an open letter saying that now is the time to kick the Russians out of the Sevastopol naval base in Crimea, on the Crimean Peninsula. And that, of course, was when Putin ordered his little green men, as they call them, to essentially go outside and seize the peninsula in a, one big coup de main. And no one was killed, by the way, when they seized the Crimean Peninsula. Their orders were basically go outside and stand on a street corner. The whole peninsula belongs to us now. And then they just made it so, as simple as that. And there were a couple of warning shots fired in the air, and that was it. And the, it was a major strategic um, objective of the United States to deprive the Russians of that Sevastopol naval base. And Putin said that, just forget that. We're not going to let you do that. They cannot allow that. This is something I wrote a few days ago, which is they have two ports that are dependable all year round. One's in Syria and one is in Crimea. And it just so happens that we have this big, huge interest in the humanitarian abuses that might be happening in those two places. Nobody could believe that. If anybody believes that, as the Southerners would say, bless your heart. But on the Russian side, they can't give that up. They've bled for that for hundreds of years. They are not going to give it up. And that's what scares me about it, is if we make noises about trying to get them out of Crimea, it could be a war. That ship's already sailed, man. And they stomped their feet and cried about it. But that is done deal. And what then what happened next was that the uh, very pro-Russian leaning factions in the very far east of the country, in the Donbass region, they call it Donetsk and Luhansk provinces there, or oblasts. They essentially said, if you guys can overthrow a democratically elected government, then we can certainly refuse to recognize it. And they started occupying government buildings and all of that. And then immediately the new government in Kiev declared a war on terrorism and invaded the eastern side of their own country and attacked them and started a massive war that killed more than 10,000 people in 2014 and 15. It was a total catastrophe. And if you go back and listen to the famous F the EU phone call from Victoria Newland. And if you also watch Gideon Rose, the editor of the journal Foreign Affairs, the Journal of the Council on Foreign Relations, and his TV appearance that he did on the old Colbert show, he were both of them a major theme of them talking about, first of all, overall, they're talking about stealing Ukraine away from Russia. That's what it's all about. As Gideon Rose tells Colbert, he says, Ukraine is Russia's girlfriend. Ukraine is Robin to their Batman. And we're stealing them away. We're here to break up the partnership and bring them over here with us. And then both of them are very confident. Newland in her leaked phone call and Rose in his TV appearance, both of them, that we're going to get away with this 
before the Russians can react. They won't be able to do anything about it. Old Putin's too busy distracted with the Sochi Olympics. And this is going to be easy. And see, he, he, don't you see how smart and clever we are that we get to do this and we get to have our way? But no, that's not what happened. Instead, they lost the Crimean Peninsula back to Russia forever. Whereas before it was at least Ukrainian territory, if not the Sevastopol naval base. And they started a massive war that only increased, for, you know, further divided Ukraine and only increased Russia's power and influence in the east of the country. No matter how many times the Americans claim that the Russians invaded, they never did. But they did send special operations forces across to help the people of the Donbass defend themselves from Kiev in this terrible war. And Rose and Newland were wrong. Oh, we're just going to make this stick. We're just going to midwife it. We're going to glue it. We're going to do this and that. We're going to put it together and it's going to be fine. It wasn't fine. It was a catastrophe. And then what do they say? Oops, that was our fault because we overthrew the government of Kiev twice in 10 years in order just to stick it right and rub the Russians' nose in it. No. Instead, the answer is, of course, Vladimir Putin is a psychopath. Vladimir Putin is is an aggressor. He's the new czar. He's the new Stalin. He's a monster. He wants to invade and, and uh, conquer and occupy all of Eastern Europe. And these people, to a very dangerous degree, I'm afraid, believe their own lies. And it's a really scary phenomenon. I saw Ann Applebaum from the Washington Post, who's a scholar on the Soviet Union and so forth, and a real hawk. This whole terror war long, she's been a real a whole post-Cold War world. She's been a hawk. And she says, listen, Vladimir Putin knows that NATO expansion is purely defensive. He knows that the only reason we want to rule all of Europe is just to keep him out. He knows that he's the aggressor and we're the defenders. And he's the one who's dangerous and always starting a fight. And we're only the ones who are trying to keep the peace. It's, you know what? It's, it doesn't sound right to me to even just phrase all of your arguments that way. Yeah, my adversary. He knows this. He knows this. Are you so sure what he's thinking right now? You so sure it's that clear to him? Which is the cart and which is the horse? Let's say Ann Applebaum is right. That really all of this is Putin started it somehow. Are you sure that Putin also admits that to himself every night in the way that Ann Applebaum never admits to herself that maybe there's another point of view? And how many tabs of acid would you have to give Ann Applebaum to get her to say, wow, actually, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not so cut and dry. Maybe the Russians have reason to believe that the Americans are the aggressors and are putting them in a desperate defensive position here. And look what Putin is warning. He's saying, you got to swear you're not going to bring Ukraine into NATO. And you have to absolutely stop moving military equipment east into the Baltic states and into Poland the way you're doing. And you've got to square that you're not going to put these anti-ballistic missile missiles in Ukraine, which we've already done in Poland, and which are launched from the, I think it's the SK-41 missile launcher. That's the same one that you can use to launch nuclear-tipped Tomahawk cruise missiles. Dual-use tech there. And He's saying, we're not going to have you do that. And you have to swear that you're not going to do that. And that's his threat. That's his buildup. And I don't know if he has real reason to believe that Biden was considering doing that. But I don't know. Is Biden, is Tony Blinken dumb enough? I hate to sound like I'm defending the guy. I assume that he's a bad guy. He's in charge of a country. Most people in charge of countries are. When you look at a map, it's hard to defend the NATO U.S. position. I, I was around when the Soviet Union fell, and I remember all of that talk back then. And that's a, a large degree why we have Putin, is because he was a strong guy that we're not going to take it anymore from the West. That's right. And also because he came to power in fighting the Chechen war, where America and Saudi Arabia were supporting the terrorists there. And so that's another big, and, and also they rigged the election for Yeltsin in 96. So if they hadn't have done that, maybe Putin wouldn't have come to power at all. He's all blowback from American intervention anyway. But just think if the Russians said, oh, we're putting defensive anti-missile missiles in Canada. But also these defensive anti-missile missiles are launched from the SK-41 missile launcher that can also launch hydrogen bomb tipped cruise missiles. And you're going to sit there and take that 
USA and say nothing. For me to even paint that picture, it's preposterous. I see you start laughing immediately. It's completely crazy. First of all, to think that the Russians would even try that. Or secondly, to think that the Americans would accept that. We would go to nuclear war and probably kill all of humanity before we let, put, let the Russians put dual-use missile launchers in Canada. And everybody knows that that's true. Everybody knows that Denis Kucinich would go to war over that. Any American, Ron Paul will go to war over that. You're not putting dual-use missile launchers in Canada, Russia. But we think that we can do this to them all day, every day, and that the absolute psychopathic madman dictator Joseph Stalin, Vladimir Putin, is going to calmly sit there and take it because what's he going to do about it? Does that sound right to you? Of course, nothing the empire says should sound right to any sane person. Folks, if you want sanity, you've got to listen to Scott Horton's show. He's got a great podcast and also read his books. You'll find out that he knows so much more than the people who get us into all these disasters. It'll make your head spin. Scott, it's been great having you here. I know I've kept you over time. Thanks so much, and I hope you'll come back. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Take care. Okay, friends, that's going to do it for today. If you haven't already, don't forget to download a free copy of my new ebook, It's the Fed Stupid, at itsthefedstupid.com. And I'll see you next time. The war of ideas has only just begun. Arm yourself with the knowledge you need by heading to TomMullenTalksFreedom.com and subscribing to our email list. And remember, every revolution starts in the minds of the people.